Hi, friends, and welcome to another episode of Your Bish Therapist. Today, I'm going to be covering Real Housewives of Orange County and Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. Last week, I covered Real Housewives of Orange County Reunion Part 1, and today's episode is going to cover the second part of the reunion. Both of these shows are chock full of drama, and I am here to mention it all. By the way, Bethany Frankel is one of those housewives that went from you know, being amazing to not so amazing and kind of being a joke in the Bravo world. But she did have that one line about mentioning it all, which I just love and will always use that forever. So thanks, Bethany. I wanted to give you guys an update in terms of I announced last podcast that I was going to be ending season three uh, in December because Yabish needs a break. The cold darkness, the world being on fire. My body in general has not been happy. And so uh, it is time for me to take a little break and a little siesta. However, I am in a conundrum because Real Housewives of Beverly Hills and Southern Charm will be back shortly. And I am completely obsessed with both of those shows and will be covering them both completely in perpetuity forever and ever. (laughs) So uh, here's how this is going to work for now. I am going to record episodes on my breaks for Spreaker's Supporters Club. It is $5 a month to hear the episodes that I will be recording. When I go on my breaks, what I plan to do is record episodes about both of those shows, post them to the Spreaker Supporters Club, and then when I come back, probably in January, I will post those episodes for people to catch up on. But if you want to hear them as they happen, you have to join my Spreaker Supporters Club. I explained that in the last episode. But basically, wherever you're listening to this podcast right now, if you scroll down, there's a link to Spreaker Supporters Club. It takes you right there. If that doesn't work for you, it's okay. All my information will be available when I come back in January for free. And until then, if you want to hear it, you can go to Spreaker. So with that being said, let us get into Real Housewives of Orange County Reunion Part 2. Oh my goodness, these reunions have been really giving. One of the things that I'm going to start out with is there was this back and forth between Heather and Katie about gossipy versus mean girl. While there is a difference, gossip plays a role in mean girl behavior. And so I kind of felt like this was a semantics game in order to justify bad behavior and evade accountability, which you all know I really cannot stand. And this was all, by the way, regarding Heather checking the price of Jen's dress and then gossiping gossiping about it to the ladies. She initially started to apologize and owned being quote unquote gossipy. That's what Heather kept saying. And she was comfortable with that label. But then as soon as Katie labeled it mean girl behavior. Heather was up in arms. So was Emily. And, you know, Emily's behavior, it it continued to disappoint me. Like I, I talked about last week, I understand why she is, you know, supporting Heather. And in her real life, maybe Heather is an important ally or friend. I have no idea. But, uh, you know, I, I think I speak for a lot of people when I say we all love Emily, um, but I certainly haven't loved her behavior at these reunions. I think it has been mean, and I think she picked the wrong couch personally. But um, so as soon as Katie labeled it Mean Girl, Heather was, of course, up in arms. They all walked back accountability saying, we all do that, and then just like choosing to be defensive. And it's like, this is what I don't like about semantics. Heather's behavior was intended to shame Jen, right? Emily and Heather both tried to say, well, we were concerned about you. No, if you were concerned about Jen, you would have talked to her privately, which by the way, Emily did. Emily did apologize to Jen and she did talk to her privately and she did own her stuff in terms of this is my stuff and this is why I was being mean to you about it. And so so I give Emily credit for that, but then trying to walk it back and saying, well, we all gossip you know, yes, housewives gossip, but we have to look at what the intention was. Heather's behavior was intended to shame Jen and intended to say, you're broke, but you're paying $2,000 for a dress, which, okay, fine, valid point. But at the end of the day, it really isn't anyone else's business. You know, I just think 
you apologize and you move on. And what Heather seems to do is she seems to apologize, but then couch it with some sort of, but we all do this or, but this is, and, and that is just a way to evade accountability. But what I wanted to talk about, I've, I've done some posts and um, I even did an episode, I forget which one it was, where I did talk about mean girl behavior, which is known in the field of psychology as relational aggression. And I wanted to talk about the word gossip and the derivation, where it comes from, because I think, you know, if people are going to use semantics, well, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, here's how this formed and and here's how this can be a problem. So gossip comes from the old English word God sib, G-O-D. S I B B, which is a combination of the word God and Sib, which means relative or kinsman. God Sib originally referred to a person who is spiritually related to another, like a godparent or a baptismal sponsor. The term was used to describe people who acted as sponsors at a baptism, but it also came to refer to the women who attended to mothers before, during, and after childbirth. The women were known as the gossips, which again, America, your misogyny is showing because you could also call those women doctors. I think now that's what they're called is doctors, but I digress. So the word gossip has evolved over time and has taken on a number of meanings. So in the 1500s, the word was mostly used to describe idle chatter and rumor. But in the 16th century, the word came to mean a person, usually a woman who enjoys idle talk or a newsmonger. So this is to me where, you know, women have been hated since the dawn of time. That's that's just facts. But in the 16th century, clearly the patriarchy had a stronghold as if men somehow don't do the same thing. It's absurd. In the 17th century, the verb to gossip first appeared in Shakespeare, which you know, Shakespeare had a huge cultural significance in the 17th century. And then in the early 19th century, the term was extended to describe conversation of people in general, not just women. And so the word gossip has a negative connotation, but it didn't start out that way. Sylvia Federici is a teacher, an activist, and a feminist, and she has investigated how gender oppression played a role in the notion of gossip. So that's basically what I'm saying, ladies, is that women have always been treated in a way that is not fair and not acceptable. And so I think as women we have to be mindful of how we are utilizing our words and how we are utilizing gossip, which can be, you know, generally harmless and more of a fun kiki, or it can be part of mean girl behavior and really damaging. So I'm just, you know, you know me, I'm not about the semantics game. But speaking of Jen, so Jen discusses her financial drama and reported working on gaining financial literacy. And you all know that I love to say we can only do better once we know better. And, you know, this is the same thing goes for Jen here. Financial health is not often taught, especially to females. And I've had many female listeners reach out to me who talked about varied experiences. They they said, thank goodness that my family did teach me this and I was able to teach my girls. That's a good example of generational wealth in terms of, you know, people look at generational wealth as money, but the new generational wealth is looked at as love and appropriate communication and healthy dynamics and, you know, uh, teaching our children about the things that they actually need, life skills. And someone actually let me know that in California, there are new rules and regulations that are bringing financial uh, courses to high schools, which is, a th- I, it's absurd to me that that hasn't been a part of curriculum. And obviously, you know, with everything that's going on now and the education system being dismantled from the inside, that's certainly not going to happen. Um, but I guess it will in California. And so my point is, is that kudos to Jen for working on it. And if you're someone who's listening to this and it's resonating, it is never too late to learn a new skill. I learned how to podcast and be an audio engineer and a social media manager. And I literally am tech elderly and it 
has taken me still over a year to understand this new language that I'm learning. If no one taught you about financial literacy, it's never too late to learn that on your own. I just want to empower people. If, if that resonates with you, there's, it, it's never too late to make a different decision, to change one's behavior, to grow, to honor ourselves in ways that are important. Because at the end of the day, our mental emotional and physical health includes financial stability. Money buys us resources that we need for, again, mental, physical, and spiritual health. So it's like, it's just important to be aware of, and I give Jen a lot of credit for working on it. I did explain this before because Jen explained this on Jeff Lewis Live, but again, she explained that her ex continually failed to make court order payments and he won't speak to her at all. She went to his house one day. He's like, get off my porch. And so as a result, they're going back to court. And everyone thinks, oh, well, she's getting this money from her ex. She isn't. Which, by the way, is it doesn't matter where you live or what socioeconomic status you're in. If you're divorced and you have five children, you need to pay alimony. You need to pay child support. You need to pay those things um, if that was what was agreed upon. And obviously he's having financial situations or, you know, who really knows if it's, you know, a multitude of reasons, but um, it's not okay. And, you know, Jen is really just trying to support her family. And so, you know, what she said about the dress, she made a very important point, which is I would never do that in the place of feeding my children. I mean, Jen is not a bad person. She trying to navigate being on the show and then, you know, having to dress the part. Ryan bought her the dress. You know, it's a tough situation that she's in. And again, she put herself here. But I just think that the situation led her to realize the importance of fiscal responsibility. And I'm just cheering her on because I think that's amazing. Then, you know, we move on to Gina, who talks about being terrorized by Travis's ex with whom he's in a contentious divorce and custody battle. Not only contentious, but extremely lengthy. Uh, Gina, you know, had her own issues with her ex, Matt, and they have divorced and wrapped things up and moved on and become friends and healed in the time that Travis's ex still has not been able to move forward. I think I need people to understand that as well, is this has been going on a long time time. And so his, Travis's ex spread false and defamatory rumors about Gina physically assaulting Travis, which that's what Shannon, that's what Tamara alleged that Shannon was looking into last year before the reunion was the ex spread rumors that Gina pushed Travis down the stairs, which that's beyond absurd. That's beyond defamatory, but that's what she says. And guess what? Whether or not gossip or rumors are true, that doesn't make it any less harmful for the person experiencing it. We all know what it's like to be the victim of gossip and being talked about. When I was in college or when I was in high school and I had cancer, everyone was whispering about me and talking about me. It does not feel good. Um, and now people are talking about me for different reasons, which, you know, that's very Freudian, but, you know, that's for me to talk to about my Bish therapist. Um, so Gina says that the rumor about her physically assaulting Travis was only one of many scary encounters. And Gina said, my kids are scared. She said, if I don't live with him, then she can't make stuff up. So here's my thoughts on this. Gina was subjected to fans and podcasters trashing her all season because this story didn't make sense to them. And I think what people do when something doesn't make sense to them is they make up their own narratives. And sometimes when you're ill-informed, that nothing good comes from that. And so I always understood that this woman was doing what she could because she loved Travis and his kids and her kids. And she's just trying to do what she can to hold this family together, despite the fact that his ex-wife is trying to tear them apart. So for me, I think Gina took a social media bullet in the name of protecting her family. And she said she fears it will never get better, but she's learning to navigate a relationship with Travis amidst the chaos. I adore Gina. I think she is a certified badass warrior and I will be cheering their whole family on because they deserve nothing but happiness. And I hope this ex-wife just figures out what's missing for her that she needs to continue to 
essentially torture other people because she's unhappy. Um, you know, trauma is not our fault, but it is our responsibility to fix it. Torturing somebody else because you're not happy is not acceptable. So I hope that she is able to figure out for her what is going on there with that. Now, going back to Heather, uh, we see her apologize to Emily about taking a shot at her with a dress was tight comment. And what surprised me most is that Emily really let her off the hook, which was shocking because I knew that wasn't your character. And Heather was like, you know, it really isn't. But it's like, but you said it. So, you know, listen, I mean, we've all said things that we don't mean. But when I say that, there's various levels, right? There's a spectrum to that. Of course. Have I said things that are unkind? Uh, yes, of course. Have I yelled? Have I, you know, yes, I'm human and therefore imperfect. So there's a part of that that's like, okay, you know, maybe Heather stepped outside of herself. But then this is what irritates me. So Heather was, after the apology, she followed the apology by noting that they all take shots at each other. So while that's true, to me, Heather constantly gives herself away by negating her words give her away. So I think that it negated her initial accountability, in my opinion. And then when Heather <laughs> dropped the bomb, oh my gosh, this was wild, that Katie's daughter went rogue, honey. She went rogue and posted a TikTok lip syncing to a song that the lyric said something about fake ass bitches who suck dick. She made a TikTok lip syncing those words and wrote at the top of it, like what I think of these women or something like that. So it was clearly directed at the housewives. So most of the women immediately shame Katie for being unable to control her child. Can I just say that mom shame is so wild? I'm not a mom, right? Which by the way, I get shamed for literally my entire life, despite the fact that I wanted to have children. It was just taken away from me due to my history of cancer, hysterectomy and all of that. It's wild to me that I'm seen as not valuable by society because I haven't procreated and haven't had children. But then you have these women who do have children who, by the way, I guarantee all of those children have done dumb shit. All of them. It's wild to me when moms shame each other because it's like, where's the where's the community? Where's the compassion? It's like your child has never done something outlandishly stupid that you didn't agree with because that's what children do. And my other thought is like, does anyone remember what it's like to be 20 years old? 20 year olds are professional dum-dums as they learn valuable lessons through massive failures and screw-ups. That's like what 20 year olds do. Katie acknowledged like this is not okay. She told her daughter, take this down. She told her daughter, you are going to get me in hot water. And the daughter did not care. Ultimately, it's important to note that we cannot control every single thing our children do, whether they're young or not. But in this case, Katie's child is technically an adult. I mean, we all know that the prefrontal cortexes in the brain are the last parts of our brain to develop at the age of 25. And for people with ADHD or neurodivergence, that age could be closer to 35. So it, my point is that people are looking at this child, a 20-year-old as an adult, but really, I mean, she's she's really not. You know, so developmentally speaking, what I'm saying is while it wasn't cool, while it was definitely provocative and, and Katie agreed this was not acceptable, she asked her daughter to take it down. She didn't. It's, I want to know more about Katie's daughter because I think it's interesting that she is the center of a lot of drama. This is now the second drama, the first being the whole babysitter gate thing. And babysitter gate was that. Katie's daughter babysat uh, Emily and Shane's sons, twin sons, and she claims they said that Kate or that Heather is mean to their mommy, but in reality, it seems like Katie's daughter said that to them, but then made it seem like it came from that. It just there seems to be some drama around Katie's daughter, which again, as a twenty-year-old professional dummy, which I use that 
joke, very jokingly. That's just my personality to say when we're young and we act in certain ways, it's just like developmental dumbness sometimes, if that makes sense. I want to know more about Katie's relationship with her daughter from a child's perspective. For a mother to say, this upsets me, this bothers me, will you do this? And then for her to say, nah, I'm good. It does make me wonder about the type of relationship they have or if Katie really did want her to take it down. You know, who knows? But my point is, is that kids are going to be kids. So, you know, we'll see if Katie's back for another season. Then we see lady, the ladies calling out Tamara for her venomous tendency to go for the jugular when angry, which is interesting timing because I've explained my own experience that I had with Tamara, but the Bravo babe on social media posted about finding out that Tamara allegedly is the head of reality blurb, allegedly. And according to the Bravo babe, it was public information. She found it and then Tamara threatened to sue her. So, you know, I think there's a pattern here. And, you know, what's interesting is the ladies are sharing their painful emotional experiences that result from being on the receiving end of Tamara's literal wrath. Andy asked Tamara, why did you wait so long to get therapy? And then she repeats Heather's line that when everyone tells you you're dead, it's time to lie down. So what I'll say is it's never too late to change, but true change only results from internal motivation, number one, and number two, it only works if we work it. Continued apology without changed behavior is manipulation. So I'm just going to leave that there. Then we see John's mouthpiece join the stage. And yes, that's how I'm going to be referring to Alexis as John's mouthpiece because I'm just like so over it. I'm so over these two people. And honestly, I don't even feel bad because we can't protect people from the consequences of their behaviors. And I think that Alexis is doing the same thing over and over. And she clearly hasn't learned some hard lessons. And I think she needs to learn them and maybe she still won't but you know she's she's got to hear people when we say when someone's telling you your dad it's time to lie down and she needs to lie down so andy asks how she reconciles being very religious with having a child who is trans inquiring about how her child's sexuality changed her and so one thing i want to note is that while it was a good question but the gender identity is more accurate. So how her child's gender identity changed her views. And and Alexis claims it hasn't changed my mind. It's made me understand the pain that that's along with it. It changed me being more vocal about it. She claims she's always been an ally, but then she also said that she wouldn't feel comfortable with a female president. And I'm just like, oh, can't. Then the Jim Bolino lawsuit was brought up, and when Alexis de- and when Alexis apologized to Tamara, I thought Shannon's eyes were going to pop out of her head. If looks could kill, they both would have been dead. Because Shannon, all she's been wanting is like the acknowledgement that yes, Alexis was involved, and so she like admits to Tamara, she's like, yes, I'm sorry for my role. And then Shannon was like, what the hell? Oh my gosh, it was wild to watch her. And then Shannon tells the story, which is. So fascinating sometimes when Shannon goes to defend herself, sometimes I think she actually ends up making herself look really bad. She she tells this story that on the day of the settlement with this lawsuit with Jim Bellino years ago, she says that she and Johnny J saw Jim Bellino at a restaurant. And by the way, I thought to myself, if this was the quiet woman, I give up. Like I... <laughs> I give up, wave the white flag, if this happened at the Quiet Woman restaurant. I want to know. And by the way, I desperately need to come out to LA and see this restaurant because I want to know, is it haunted? Uh, Is it built on, you know, some sort of sacred ground? Like, why is it the source of such intense trauma? (laughs) But anyway... So Jim Bellino at the restaurant provoked Shannon in some way, shape, or form, and she was going to settle that day, but then she said to him, you're a jerk and I refuse to settle, and then she went to court. And we find out she won in accordance with the court of law. She did not defame Jim Bellino, but the process cost her $300,000. 
And then cut to the current day legal saga, Shannon talks about offering to pay John the full amount of 70000 but he refused to sign a mutual non-disparagement agreement, and the process is ongoing. Okay, here's my point. This is a pattern at this point, and it makes me wonder a couple of things. Number one, how far do we go in the game of battle of the wills? And number two, how much do we allow harmful people to goad us into chaos? Because the fact of the matter is, Shannon was like hanging her hat on the fact that she won against Jim Bellino, but you spent $300,000 while your twins were just on their way to college. College today is outlandish. So is that a year of college tuition for one person? I have no idea. California's wild. You understand my point. Okay, so Jim provoked her and he got a rise out of her. And so she wasted $300,000 of her money just because he provoked her and she wanted to be right and she didn't want to settle. And so again, the same with John. It's like, sometimes we don't want to cut off our nose to spite our face in the name of righteousness or feeling like I've been wronged. I've been wronged by bazillions of people in my life. And I know for a fact that, you know, there's some things you can do, but there's a lot that you can't. And so I think that Shannon needs to understand her role in this kind of chaos carousel that she finds herself in. And then we see Alexis trying to bend the time-space continuum by like claiming she didn't mean to bring up the incriminating videos of Shannon, but she did in a quote unquote weak moment. What? Actually, she brought the videos up in multiple moments, but sure, Jan, whatever you believe. And then Alexis claims John has never brought it up, meaning the videos. And so I just couldn't help but wonder if John never brought up the videos, how did Alexis know about them? Is she employed as his head of security? Is she back there, you know, on the ones and twos and looking at his, uh, his security camps? I don't understand. Make no mistake. Okay. This is a pathetic attempt at damage control and impression management. And here's what annoys me about Alexis. Of course, that's what John's going to do, right? John is going to do damage control. You know, all men who do terrible things try to say, I'm not a bad person and I didn't do those things that I for sure definitely did. Okay, that's right. Par for the course. But Alexis is falling on a patriarchal sword in the name of standing by her men and trying to absolve them of any responsibility ad infinitum. Different guy same sword, same sad behavior. So for me, if Alexis comes back next season, I'm not joking. I do not think I can watch it. I just can't. I I don't want to see John Jansen. I do not want to see Alexis. Uh, I, if she came back, I don't want to see this being talked about. You know, she came to the reunion and gloated right in front of Shannon about like being engaged. It's just so messy. It's just so gross. It's so calculated. And I just can't. So please, bravo, hear me. Check one, two, check, check, check. Get her away from us, please. All right, now let's move on to Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. This season is giving in a way that I could have never imagined. Jen Shaw who? Also, I kind of do wish Monica would have been back, but, you know, because here's the thing. So Reality Von Tees, again, what the Bravo Babe found out is basically, my point is a lot of housewives play the game and may have roles in social media and media outlets that we aren't privy to, okay? So acting like Monica is the spawn of Satan for what she did, let's please save our faux outrage, ladies who are doing this behind the scenes. Okay, so the episode starts with Todd. Oh gosh, I have so many thoughts on Todd. But Todd telling Lisa, John Barlow that this has to stop or Lisa has to go. John breaks the news to Lisa, who kept saying she was uncomfortable and she was like braiding her hair, her hair furiously, which by the way, it reminded me of this hilarious SNL skit. And I think it's Kristen Wiig where she she had this character when she, when she was really nervous, she would like braid her hair like a psycho. It's the way that my brain works in terms of pop culture references. It's just like... 
I don't know. It's sometimes I feel like it's like a, a spinning wheel that randomly lands on something bizarre. But that's exactly what it reminded me of. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can Google it. But anyway, Lisa's discomfort was likely created by the fact that she struggles to take any accountability and she's not accustomed to having someone draw a hard boundary with her. John Barlow could never. John Barlow is Lisa's lapdog. John Barlow is very mild-mannered. He's the type of person that Lisa would have to be married to. Otherwise, that marriage would not survive. The way she talks to him and talks to other people and obsessively talks about being right. I mean, I just can't imagine what it would be like to be in a relationship with her. I mean, I don't think there's room for other people in her relationships, if I'm being honest. And so Lisa is used to overreacting, yelling, and creating drama without any consequence, also being rewarded for it, right? Because like people love her on Housewives, which who, where, and why, I personally don't understand. She's been celebrated or rewarded for her behavior with housewives, but like in reality, that behavior is gross and unacceptable. So Todd provided her with a serious consequence, which she's not used to, and she didn't want to risk leaving early and being excluded from filming. It's that simple. So Lisa initially sucked it up and was like on the verge of apologizing to Bronwyn, but then like a true drama addict, she just could not help herself and went in on Whitney instead. So this tells me that Lisa can control her behavior, but not her emotions. Her anger came out sideways on Whitney. When we're having feelings about something, and if we don't properly process them, it, it'll come out sideways. And that's, to me, exactly what happened here. But Lisa sincerely has no emotion regulation skills. She has no ability to keep a lid on what feels like an obsessive need to be right and to just talk something to death until someone tells her, you're right, you're perfect, you're baby gorgeous. And that's just, that's not how it is. So to me, Lisa's tactic to win arguments is fatiguing the enemy. And the audience is fatigued too. Bloop. Lisa lacks awareness of how her behaviors impact others because quite frankly, I don't think she cares. I think she's very self-focused and she was like on the verge of being kicked out due to her drama circus, but she continued her show. She disrespected Bronwyn and Todd's boundaries and home and Todd reported he will never do this again, which I couldn't help but wonder how that will impact Bronwyn in terms of her possible return. Because what I was seeing is this trip to their home for their anniversary was a test to see how would Bronwyn fare as a housewife. And so I think she fares great, but I think that Todd, from what I'm seeing, and especially in the midseason trailer, we see that he is going to be one of those husbands who is like, I'm not doing this. And then she's going to be put in a position where it's like, well, where do we go from here? So so speaking of Todd and, and their relationship, Meredith calls out Todd and Bronwyn's dynamic, saying they have a mild tension. I would say it's much more than mild um, and an unusual engagement with each other. So while some of Todd's reaction is actually appropriate, because housewife drama should be horrifying to the average person. Like if, if housewives came in my home and acted like that for 10 minutes, I'd be like, you got to go, right? You Like take this mess out of here somewhere else. Actually, I would love housewives to come here and cause drama. So I revoke that previous statement. Please come have a dinner party here and let me mediate it. Oh, I feel like that could be a fun show on Bravo. But you know, a girl can dream. So my point is that some of Todd's reaction is appropriate, but but I definitely was happy to hear Bronwyn verbalize that his treatment of her is unacceptable at times. It's absolutely unacceptable. It's inappropriate. I think that there is true love between them, but they express that love very differently. I think that Todd barks orders. I explained this I don't know, one of my last podcasts, which is like people who are heads of companies. Well, he created Palm Pilot. People who are in positions like that don't get there by being having a high emotion, high emotional IQ. I've explained before that CEOs and people in these positions, they take these personality tests to make sure and determine that they have the appropriate personality style to lead a company shrewdly. 
And that doesn't happen by having a ton of empathy. So my point is that t- what makes Todd successful enough to buy her a $4 million necklace, which by the way, did they really buy that or was that just for the show? Because that's wild. I, I mean, Mazel also, like us regular people could never, never. So I just think that Bronwyn appears to fawn as a result and, and so let me explain the fawn process is a trauma response that involves people pleasing behaviors to avoid conflict or disapproval. So we see Bronwyn, he barks orders and then she has these nonverbals where she shrinks into herself. She hangs her head, avoids eye gaze, puts her hand over her face and suppresses her emotions. And she excels at explaining away Todd's gruff behaviors, which tells me she's had a lot of practice. And, you know, I think that I'm really interested to see more of Bronwyn because I wonder with her situation with her daughter and her daughter's father and the family drama, what her upbringing was, um, because she seems to be doing what I think Bryn does from New York, which is she's trying to convince people to love her. Love me, see me, accept me, don't misunderstand me. And that's usually a trauma response because people who never felt seen or validated or things like that try to convince people to love us for the rest of our lives. Sometimes it's conscious, sometimes it's subconscious. Mostly it is subconscious or completely unconscious. So I do see a little bit of that in Bronwyn with Todd. It's like she wants safety, she wants security, she wants stability. But I think what she really wants is just a loving partner. And Todd is not really going to be able to play any other role than Todd. (laughs) You know, then we at the pool, we watch once more a dead horse being beaten to death. Lisa continued to invalidate Bronwyn due to her inability to be honest about her feelings about Bronwyn. So we find out It's really not about Heather at all, not even a little bit. Lisa doesn't like Bronwyn. She thinks she's two-faced. And also, I think that Salt Lake City has this wild uh, pact with, uh, you know, each other, the OGs, in terms of, like, these newbies don't get to be popular, you know, anymore. Like, it's us. It just feels very Queen Bee to me. That's that's my impression. And Lisa truly does not understand that friendships are not alliances. Like you can be friends with people who don't necessarily enjoy each other. There's a way to do that. And Lisa just has no idea. Bronwyn did realize at some point that she was begging Lisa to hear and validate and understand her. And so I, I, I do believe that these are the same wounds that led her to her current marriage dynamic. And the last thing I want to say, watching Lisa claim that she wanted to get home to her son, right? She was desperate to get home to him. And then she found out that the 47-minute flight home, uh, she would be sitting in coach, and she lost her mind about it. Literally lost her mind. Unhinged behavior. And Bronwyn flies you out on a private plane, hosts you all weekend at her beautiful home, You have to pay for nothing or do nothing. She's also flying you back. You didn't have to pay for that or Bravo pay for it or whoever. And you're going to complain about 47 minutes in coach. Get a grip, Lisa. I mean, it's like, are there no other people in Salt Lake City? Are there not? Because I'm so tired of this. Oh my God. The self-focused entitlement is just like, it's just beyond at this point. And I just, honestly, I don't really, I don't enjoy Lisa. I just don't. Watching Mary talk to Robert Jr. was heartbreaking. Robert Jr. and his wife were unable to hold basic conversation, appeared disheveled, ragged, disconnected. The room was a mess. It's clear that they were unwell. It's clear that they were on substances. And it's clear that they are heavily codependent. Mary appears so grief stricken, saying, He gives me reason to live and I feel like I'm losing him to something. And, you know, one thing I, I just want to say about this is addiction is a family disease, meaning everyone in the system is impacted and everyone plays a role whether they like it or not. Mary's her openness to understanding. Her codependent enabling tells me that she's ready to do her part. Because the the fact of the matter is, is that people 
in addiction need consequences, bottom line. Sometimes that means family members drawing lines to to refuse to love their loved one to death. It's a very painful process. It never ending, in fact. It lasts as long as love does, which is forever. The mid-season trailer shows Robert Jr. reaching a crisis level, and I look forward to cheering him on in his recovery. And who knew that I would ever be rooting for Mary? What a wild ride. Oh, you know what? One last thing I did want to say is talking about Angie Kay's husband, Sean, and Seth doing I believe they were doing too much. And I was like, do they want snowflakes? What's going on here? Seth yells at Whitney, here's the proof, biatch. That is not acceptable, you know, for a husband to talk to a woman like that. And it's so ridiculous to me because Meredith didn't even flinch. But it's like, does anyone remember that they were fighting because of how Justin talked to Lisa. Essentially what happened is Sean went on the Velvet Rope podcast where he talked about Meredith took the opportunity to leverage her son and things like that, knowing that this didn't land quite the way they wanted to. That's a direct quote. So the subtext here is that Meredith leveraged Brooke's sexuality to garner favor after a bad season, which a lot of people felt like she did. But he denied he denied talking about Brooks. This comes back to, to a case of irritated by semantics. Meredith may have done that, and he talked about that she may have done that, period. So arguing about the semantics or trying to argue, well, who's more right or who's whatever is just silly. So, I, I, you know, I don't know. I really felt a certain way about that, but a lot of people on my Instagram felt a different way. Uh, they felt like, you know, Meredith can be sneaky and he was just, you know, calling her out on it and making points. This is the housewives, not the house husbands. And I think sometimes these house husbands need to mind their P's and Q's, but hey, that's just me. You're a rogue feminist. So for today, this is going to be it. Stay tuned again for Anatomy of Lies. Stay tuned for a podcast with Mandy Slutsker and stay tuned for more Bite sized Bish. Please remember to subscribe, follow Your Bish Therapist podcast. Please give a five-star review if you could be so kind. Please follow me at Your Bitch Therapist on social media. And I appreciate all your support and look forward to talking to you again. Please take care of yourselves and each other. Ta-ta for now. Disclaimer. Posts are not intended to diagnose, treat, or provide medical advice. Your Bish Therapist is for entertainment and informational purposes only. The podcast, my opinions, and posts are my own and not associated with past or present employers, any organizations, Bravo TV, Greyheart Productions, or any other television network. The information in YBT Podcast and on its social media is provided for general informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat. Please do not act or refrain from acting based on anything you read, see, or or here on YBT podcast or associated social media, communicating with YBT via email and or social media does not form a therapeutic alliance. Melissa, operator of YBT, is unable to provide any therapeutic advice, treatment, or feedback.